Welcome to Peak Oil and the Infinite Growth Monetary Paradigm. Great panel. Uh, this first talk will be in memory of Michael C. Rupert, who took his life seven weeks ago today. Over the course of the last three days, the website Zero Hedge has reported a 500% rise in Spain's long-term unemployment, China's housing bubble desperation in six words, buy one floor, get one free, and Japanese retail sales collapse by most on record. In 2011, Austria attempted to, tell, to sell some of its mountains to pay off its debt, and as of five days ago, Greece is selling 110 beaches, having already put a few islands on the market. On the environmental front, Dust Bowl conditions have returned to Kansas, Oklahoma, and North Texas. A deadly pig virus, which wiped out 10% of the U.S. hog population, is back. And there's a bloody water war happening in New Mexico's capital. Near, sorry, near Mexico's capital. But most alarming of all, the journal Science just published a study which says species of plants and animals are dying out at least a thousand times faster than before the advent of the human species and ten times faster than scientists had previously believed. That's a bit of an oops. The study warns of what it calls a sixth great extinction. But the news isn't all bad, said the scientists conducting the study. Smart technology facilitates our ability to keep track of that extinction. If the passengers of the Titanic had had smartphones, they could have taken selfies as they went down. <laughs> Lest anyone tell you that the powers that be never saw any of this coming, if that is true, it's because they chose to look the other way. These trends were foretold by a number of maverick journalists and economists, the sort who are written off as fringy conspiracy theorists until they're shown to be correct, by which time, of course, it's too late. However, let the government not be accused of standing by idly in response. They have taken such decisive action as fining a couple $746 for feeding the homeless and passing Directive 3025.18, granting President Obama the authority to use military force against civilians. I know that those quotes are going to be used against me as, you know, being cherry-picking, but the point is somewhat facetious. Among the general public, there is a consensus we're in trouble, but little understanding of the underlying reasons. It is the hope of this panel to clarify them. First, the misunderstandings. Nesta, the UK's innovation foundation, is offering 10 million pounds to the genius who can solve one of the world's six greatest problems. This is to celebrate the 300th anniversary of the Longitude Act, which launched the prize that helped, quote, humanity conquer the world. The London Telegraph writes, Longitude unlocked the secret of accurate navigation, saved countless lives, and this is the key, helped traders exploit the Earth's vast resources from minerals to spices and more. The six candidates for world's biggest problem, according to Nesta, range from antibiotic-resistant diseases to finding more efficient ways to plumb the planet with safe drinking water. That's an interesting way to put it, because it sounds as though plumb means provide. But on the contrary, we plumb the earth to provide drinking water to people. The prize is implicitly accepting that we're depleting a declining and rather important resource. What the Longitude Prize also implies is, for the, is that for the bargain basement price of 60 million pounds, they could solve all six of the world's greatest problems and we could breathe easy. This is reminiscent of an analogy that once appeared on oilempire.us. A tree would grow to the moon if you just gave it enough money. What the donors of the prize are looking for, then, is an ingenious solution that will allow humanity to continue doing what it's been doing so magnificently for 300 years, pillaging and plundering the earth. It is a premise of this panel that such a course of action is neither possible nor desirable. It is a disaster. The Longitude Prize is looking in the wrong direction. The more ingenious we become at exploiting the Earth, the faster it will be depleted. If we, if we care about the future, not even something so remote as our children's future but our own, we have to question our most fundamental assumptions. What happens 
when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object? Nobody knows, but we're about to find out. The unstoppable force, anybody want to guess? The economy. And what's unstoppable about it? Growth. You always read in the newspaper, good news, growth is robust, or growth is declined, but is, is expected to recover by fill in the date. But there is no question in these articles that growth is healthy and indeed the goal. However, nothing in nature grows forever except cancer. So much for the unstoppable force. What is the immovable object in our metaphor? The earth and everything on it, the water, minerals, food, and soil, which ever since the Industrial Revolution we've been using up at exponentially growing rates. And what's particularly immovable is the finiteness of that earth and those resources. The resources seem vast because they're bigger than each of us individually, but they're not so big when you add us all together. Um, and I just saw that the average American uses about 70 times as much water as the average African. That brings us to a third key concept for the day, exponents. Any time you have exponential growth of anything, the curve it makes eventually takes a turn from basically horizontal to basically vertical. When you multiply by a number even as small and unassuming as two, and you do that 10 times, you're up to over 1,000. Another seven times and you're in the millions, and so on. The further you go, the bigger things get and the faster they get there. Exponents are relevant to this discussion because of the way banking works. A bank goes into the business of lending because of what comes back to it, interest. When the loan is repaid with interest, the bank lends that amount out, ultimately receiving an even larger amount because they're getting interest on the now larger principal. For the system to continue, the government, or in our case, the Federal Reserve, is obliged to keep printing larger quantities of dollars. What makes the process more insidious is our system of fractional reserve banking. If you deposit $100 in the bank, they are permitted by law to lend out 90% of that or an even larger amount. The percentages are subject to change without notice. If there's a crisis or if people simply start getting nervous about the banking system and if the news of that nervousness becomes public, thereby generating more nervousness which evolves into a panic, Everyone will be banging on the doors of their respective banks at the same time, and guess how much they're going to get back? 10%. And FDIC is no panacea. It's almost insolvent. These scenarios, unlikely as they seem, have taken place at the Royal Bank of Scotland and in Cyprus. That doesn't mean the United States is immune. It just means that if it happens here, it's going to make a bigger noise. We're seeing the results of this process play out now. When oil was first discovered a mere 150 years ago, there were a billion people on Earth. There are now seven billion. If you want an economy that continues to grow the way it has over the last 150 years, you're going to need the population to grow commensurately. And that means, as we just saw with exponents, you're going to need billions more to support the billions now who will have aged. But there's a problem, as Japan is finding out. That growth spurt in population was due to easy oil. Well, why? One reason was transportation. The average piece of food in the U.S. travels, you want to know, you want to guess how much it travels? How far? Well, okay, 1,500 miles to get to you. But even more crucially, oil and gas are the source for pesticides and fertilizers which spawned the Green Revolution of the 60s. Without easy oil and gas, food production will decline. Not only that, but those same pesticides and fertilizers that produced so much food for so many years were drying out the soil as they went. That soil is now addicted to ever-increasing infusions of oil and gas at the same time as supplies are hitting a peak and heading for a decline. And that is what is meant by the phrase peak oil. Not, as its deniers would have you believe, that we're running out of the stuff. It's true that half of it is still left to be drilled, but the half that is left is not the same quality as the half we've been using. It's harder and more expensive to get. This is why BP had to resort to drilling in the Gulf of Mexico, and guess what happened there? Remember this the next time you see a headline about a great new find of oil deposits off the coast of Brazil or Angola. And there's something else you need to know before you get excited by that headline. The world uses over 80 million barrels of oil a day. So if they find a billion barrels, that's good for 12 days. 10 billion barrels, four months. One more key concept. 
As long as most of us have been alive, the dollar has been the reserve currency of the world, a status it acquired at the Bretton Woods Conference towards the end of World War II. This kept it strong and allowed us to print money on an as-needed basis. We went off the gold standard August 15, 1971, when Richard Nixon decided that was better than declaring bankruptcy. Then we went on a petrodollar standard when Nixon arranged with the king of Saudi Arabia to have OPEC accept only dollars for oil. And that also worked until one member of OPEC decided to branch out into euros. Would you like to guess who that was? No. That was Saddam Hussein. And guess what happened to him? The dollar, like many other powerful currencies today, operates by fiat, which means it is not based on any real commodity. It's based on the strength of the government issuing it, or at least the faith of the governed in that strength. Fiat currencies have a history of collapsing because the countries or empires issuing them get carried away, as we have been doing. After Saddam, Iran announced it would set up an oil bourse, which would trade oil in non-dollar currencies. And for several years, China has been working to replace the dollar with alternatives including gold and a basket of other currencies, their own, the ruble, and so on. Now the threat of the loss of dollar hegemony is becoming a reality. Just last week, the Russian bank VTB signed a deal with the Bank of China to accept currencies other than the dollar for investment banking, interbank lending, and other sorts of deals. The next day, Russia dumped a record number of United States treasuries. What did they buy instead? What do you think they bought? Gold. Very good, gold. <laughs> At the same time, Russia and China signed a 400 billion, holy shit, I mean holy grail gas deal. And Russia announced it will be building eight nuclear power plants in Iran. For the United States, this is not the writing on the wall. This is the crumbling of the wall. At the same time, tensions are high between China and Japan over the Senkaku or Diaoyutai Islands, depending on where you're from. And more recently in the south, between China and Vietnam, over drilling in the East Sea. So that's where we are as far as the problem goes. Now we get to the but what about phase of the discussion. What about wind, solar, geothermal, electricity, hydrogen, biomass, algae, nuclear fusion, et cetera, et cetera. It is time to introduce the notion of net energy. Renewables are wonderful. We love them very much, but they are no panacea. At its height, when easy oil gushed out of the ground, it took only one barrel of energy to produce on average 30 barrels in return. That's a windfall, and it's what's responsible for the complexity of modern society. No matter how sleep-deprived you may feel because your own energy is exhausted, the industries that keep places like New York City in business do not produce energy, they use it. For a society like ours to function, the few energy producers have to provide an enormous surplus for the rest of us parasites to live on. There is no renewable or oil substitute that approaches the 30 to 1 record of the oil on which we've built contemporary life. And since we've more or less hit peak oil, even oil itself has seen better days. I read that the current ratio is about 20 to 1, but the renewables don't approach that either. In fact, corn ethanol, which was supposed to save us about 10 years ago, had a ratio of approximately 1.3. These days, the godsend is supposed to be shale oil, which has a ratio of 4 to 1 or 7 to 1, with an outlier estimate of 13 to 1. And in case Steve Horn does not show up, I will tell you that the estimates for shale were um, reduced by the EEIA by 96%. In California. In Monterey shale, thank you, in California. When the ratio approaches 1, there's no company that will be delusional enough to invest in the industry. In fact, the late Matthew Simmons used to say that the oil companies were not bothering to build infrastructure because they knew that it wouldn't pay off. So this is another detail you need to think about when someone broadcasts the news of the next savior on the energy front. What is the return on energy invested? 
And when the inevitable Ted Fellow applies for the Longitude Prize with an invention that produces eight or 10 units of energy for everyone invested, which would be fantastic, is it scalable? What would it take to build the infrastructure to produce that on a significant scale? You have to look at the whole picture. Students are fond of pointing out how the internet changed the world in ways no one anticipated. The same may be said for electricity, antibiotics, and a host of other inventions. And we're not denying the truth of that observation. What the students are suggesting with that example, however, is that given enough incentives, say 10 million pounds, the right genius will be motivated to stay, save us all. What we are pointing out is that genius is not enough. Nuclear power would not have been possible without Einstein, but it would also not have been possible without uranium and a number of other elements whose names are not so familiar to the average seventh grader. So is it hopeless? No. But life as we know it is in for a sea change. Here's a quote from a report written by Hirsch, Wendling, and Besbeck for the United States Department of Energy in 2005. That's not a fringy conspiracy group. The world has never faced a problem like this. Without massive mitigation more than a decade before the fact, the problem will be pervasive and will not be temporary. Previous energy transitions, wood to coal and coal to oil, were gradual and evolutionary. Oil peaking will be abrupt and revolutionary. You may wonder if the situation is so dire, why it hasn't been more prominent in the news. Instead, we have Chinese pollution, Chinese spying, government corruptions in corruption in countries everywhere, everywhere other than the United States, countries which might benefit from a regime change, human interest tragedies, and celebrity wardrobe malfunctions. Politicians and the economy benefit in the short term by keeping the myth going that everything on the macro scale is fine. Any dips in your welfare will only be temporary. And this is why the average person needs to understand these issues. It is not enough to leave it to the experts. They have their own agenda. And since they have not done a good job, the problems need to be understood at a grassroots level by people who slept through economics and science in high school and breathed a sigh of relief that they'd never have to think about those subjects again. The concepts are not difficult. We need a critical mass of understanding, what is sometimes called the hundredth monkey. One more minute. Monkeys can learn a new task by copying other monkeys. But when a certain number of monkeys perform the task, the entire population adopts it. That's what we need with respect to understanding the current predicament the Earth is in. Any techno fix will only be temporary at best. What's needed is a questioning of every assumption we took for granted our whole lives and an overhaul of the entire system with relocalization, a reversion to rail travel, food not lawns, and an abolition of fiat currency, fractional reserve banking, and interest. If we don't deal with this now, it will deal with us later. Thank you.